Okay, um, here we are, for, uh, Fern. It's uh, September 23rd, I think I said. 23rd. Was oh, it 22nd? Okay, 22nd of September 2011. We're uh, almost exactly two years after your ketamine infusion, okay? And just sort of as a brief synopsis, you came back about two months after that, and clearly there was a significant improvement uh, in function and in pain, okay? Correct. And then you came back approximately eight months later, and there was some deterioration, okay? And um, we talked about what a possible explanation for that could be, and we said that probably insufficient follow-up with ketamine infusions. Ketamine infusions um, probably that were, if you did have them, they probably were not as effective as they could be in terms of dosing and in terms of duration. Because we know the best effects of ketamine are when the dose is high and held up high. It's not just about getting the dose up, okay? Yeah. So usually it takes a minimum of three days for someone like you to get a, uh, uh, of infusions to get the, uh, the effect that we're looking for. And sometimes it takes maybe four days. Again, we're not talking about the coma here, are we? We're talking about high dose ketamine, yeah. okay, that can be done on an outpatient basis. Now, um, I think what we need to do now, oh, we did your pain thresholds, and your pain thresholds have really deteriorated. Um, they're back to, you know, what they were prior, probably prior to your ketamine coma, okay? You've got allodynia uh, pretty severe right now. Now, another thing that happened in the meantime, you've developed some burning in your mouth. Why don't you tell us about that? Um, my tongue feels like it's on fire mm -hmm. and swollen, and my teeth ache and my gums hurt. Okay. And we talked about what may be a causative factor going to a dentist. Yes. And the dentist uh, uh, going in there and doing some things without good pain control and that without can set any. up. <laughs> without any, right, yes. without any pain control and that can be uh, catastrophic in somebody that has uh, RSD and can set it up in that region of your body. Yeah. So I let's go over that real, while, it's, while that's sort of in our, on our minds, right? Let's talk about what the dentist should be doing, okay? Right. What they should be doing is they should make it so you feel no pain, even for cleaning your teeth. If that means doing uh, blocks on both sides of your mouth so you're numb on both sides, including your cheeks and so forth and so on for three, four hours, it has to be done. Because if they don't do that, uh, that will set off the RSD, okay? Right. And also, if for post-operative pain management, that's acute injury. We talked about acute injury. May require opioids <clears throat> on a temporary basis. And so post-operatively, after the procedure's done, that pain needs to be controlled, okay? I tell patients if, you know, patients of mine, if they're going to go to the dentist and have the dentist call me. So we make sure we get that very clear in their head. It's critically important, okay? Normal people, like this gentleman over here who is semi-normal. I'm not normal. <laughs> <laughs> we can afford to tough it out, but CRPS patients can't, can't afford to do Not that. good. Not good. Right. Not good. Exactly. So, so if you're in the dental chair and, and you're having uh, pain or discomfort, you need to let them know, okay? Now, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to come back to some of these things a little bit later, but let's go ahead and do some functional testing on you right now, see where you're at. Do the vertical finger test. Look straight ahead. Don't follow me. See if you can get two fingers in your mouth. All right, you're having pain when you do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, where are you having the pain when you do that? In my jaw. Is it worse on one side than the other? No. Okay. And uh, so in your jaw, point again so I can know exactly where that pain is. From about here all the way down. Okay, gotcha. Understood. Okay, take that right hand behind your head, please, as best you can. There you go. All right, good. And, and uh, do the le uh, left now. There you go. Yeah, so that you're much limited there, right? Now, I would say you're a little bit better there, not much, than when you went into the ketamine coma. You're a little bit better, okay? Now, with regards to um, the, uh, the upper extremities, we need to do one more test on you. I want you to take that right hand out in front of you, please. Open and close your hand as fast as you can. a girl. All right, good, good, good. Now do your left, please. Very good. Very good, all right? So you're a little sluggish there, okay? Now... The next thing we want to just turn our attention down to your legs. I want you to go to that right ankle and rotate your right ankle, please. There you go. And uh, wiggle your toes. Okay. And you're already going to hitchhike back to, uh, kind of, you're on the west coast of Canada. What's that province called? British Columbia. British Columbia. My God, they're going to hate me over there now. <laughs> go ahead. Rotate your, uh, the other, the worst side, which is this side here. See how well you can do that. Not very much, can you? Wiggle your toes for me. Okay, get that toe, toe up on the on that side if you can. 
can't do it. Okay. okay. All right. And you and also we notice how much more shiny your skin is here on that uh, left compared to the right, which correlates with your RSD, doesn't it? Okay, I, Fan, I'm, uh, Fern, I'm going to ask your husband to be near your side here as you get, try to get up from that chair, just for safety reasons. I want to see what you can do on your own, okay, as far as getting out of the chair. And go stand by the door, please. That a girl. Just do the best you can. He's there if you need him, okay? Yeah. Yeah, that a girl. There you go. As best you can, over by the door. And he's there. That's right. Hold his hand just to be on the safe side. There you go. Good, good, good. Now, um... I'm going to ask you to take three steps forward and three steps back, and I'm going to ask you about where your pain is located, okay? Go ahead, please. And a girl. One, two, three. Okay, now go back, please. There you go. Now, especially on that left leg, which is your worst leg, where did you feel the pain when you did that? Um, pretty much the whole leg, but very much in the ankle. In the ankle. Now, another thing we talked about, Fern, is you got a lot of pain in that, that, that anterior aspect of your left thigh, right? Yes. And that's following the dermatome for the femoral nerve, okay, which may be uh, being set off by the RSD, okay? I have actually a lot in the sciatic nerve as well. But in the back, the, near the butt tuck, right, gotcha, gotcha. Now, let me ask you this, can you walk on your toes? Can you want to give that a try and see if you can do that? Your I husband's going to hold your hand. I can do this side. You can't, no, then you can't do it if you can't put both down. You can't do that, can you? No. Okay, how about your heels? Can you do your heels? You can't do it. Okay, we just want to see what you can do and not do, right? Okay, go ahead and have a seat, please. I can finally beat her at an arm wrestle and 100 yard dash. Yes. <laughs> finally, yeah. Finally. Yeah, which brings a point up. I mean, she was very athletic before all this happened. Very much so. Very, very athletic. Okay. Now, I, I want to. run it back. Yeah. I want to. I, first of all, what I want to do is I want to give you what my conclusion is. It's been over a year since you've had a ketamine infusion, okay? You desperately, desperately need to have a ketamine infusion, okay? And if you don't have a ketamine infusion, um, and it should be for at least three days, uh, preferably four if somehow that can be worked out, and it should be at a relatively high dose. I'm not talking about coma here. I'm talking where they can try to get it up to at least 200 milligrams an hour, okay? Um, now, they may not be able to. There's no, this is not a cookbook type of treatment, okay? They have to monitor you for safety, your vital signs. They have to monitor for creature comforts, too. As you know, you're very sensitive to any type of medication. You get nauseated really, so they've got to know how to treat that. Okay, so because um, if you, if creature comforts aren't taken care of, you're not going to get the dose up. Okay, all right. So that's one thing. And also, I'm hoping that when they, who, if you have it done someplace else, that they document objectively your outcome, because it means no makes mean has no meaning to me. You know, for patients to come back and say, well, you know, I felt better. And I, I need to see some evidence, and it, and it can your your outcome can be documented on an objective basis. Okay, all right. Now. The other thing we want to talk about here, and I'm going to put you on the spot, Fern, all right? You're back in school now, okay? You ready for your test question? I'm ready. All right. Is there a role for opioids, narcotics, in treating chronic CRPS or RSD? Yes. Okay, explain that to us. To use it on a short-term basis to bring the inciting pain down. So if I go for a walk or get my teeth cleaned or do extra around the house, and I flare up, I need to take the opiates. Yeah, we call that acute injury, right? Correct. It's totally different. It's all di chemicals are released that have nothing to do with CRPS. And why does it have to be treated? Because it flares the whole body. That's right. It sets off the RSD and the chronic RSD that's ongoing. But the opioids are relatively ineffective, right? Correct. For treating uh, the chronic ongoing CRPS, the neuropathic pain. And you will and anyone will get constipated. That can become a major, major problem, okay? And over time, if taken long enough, it can actually lead to increased pain. We call it hyperalgesia allodynia, right? All right. So that's one thing I wanted to make sure uh, we, uh, we cleared up. Now I'm going to turn over to your husband because your husband had a lot of questions and I want to make sure we cover them. Uh, was there a question in particular you want me to address at this time? Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what people that don't have access to IV ketamine can do yeah. to help control their pain? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to level with it right between your eyes, okay? Your options are extremely limited. Yes, you can encourage the patient to get, try to get into some heated pool exercise. It's not always readily available, as you've learned living in Canada, right? No, we, we can't get it Right, at all. right, exactly, exactly. So under those circumstances, uh, you, need to get a, you need to have a, a heated pool built in. 
you know, endless pool or something where the water can be get to the right temperature. And the temperature varies from one patient to another, okay? So if you get in the water and it's cold, that's okay. But after three minutes, if it's still cold, you got to get out, okay? You cannot chill your muscles down if you have CRPS, okay? So uh, that's one thing. So, it, But that's very limited. What you really need to do is to have the ketamine uh, infusions done. She's had them before. She responds to them. She gets better from them. And, but you, if you let too much time go by, as it has happened here, you know, over a year, this is what can happen. You can really slide backwards, okay? Now, but does get, the infrared sauna not do the same thing? I'm not familiar with infrared sauna. I don't know. I can't comment on something I don't know anything about. Okay? okay? All right. How about you, Fern? Did you have something you wanted to cover? Um, I wanted to ask about the IVIG. Yeah, right. And if we can look at the use of anti-inflammatories, but how to do it so that it's actually helpful instead of harmful. Right. Okay, let's take one thing at a time. Um, the evidence isn't ironclad, but there is evidence that um, the neuropathic pain due to CRPS it has an, an, an immunodeficiency component to it, okay? Evidence, okay? Um, and uh, Dr. Schwartzman in Philadelphia has had probably more experience with giving IV um, immuno, uh, immunologic, immuno sub, uh, oh, replacement yes. therapy, okay? Yes. And there are potential complications that can happen from that, okay? So I would defer to him, and I know you've been in contact with him to get the information on that, okay, on that thing. Um, we don't do that here. Uh, if I see s some really clear evidence that it really helps you folks with CRPS, um, I'm, I'm inclined to, to offer that, but not at this time. And you're thinking that the fentanyl patch is... Yeah, right. In your situation, since you, 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 you uh, tend to get uh, hives, itching, and that sort of thing from the usual characters and opioids, you need to go with something probably that's less likely to release histamine, like, for example, the uh, fentanyl, which comes in nasal, comes in the lollipop, comes in um, patches, and so forth, okay? Temporarily to get you over the acute pain injury, okay? Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Well... I was just thinking about something that you said, where uh, you were talking about um, you're talking about the the dosing and and you know measuring exactly how much benefit the patient is receiving. If you have a patient that says, "Wow, I feel a lot better," that's important. May not may not help uh, with with the uh, with the uh, you know being able to put numbers on it. But that person who's uh, who's just had an infusion and feels better regardless of the numbers. That's important too though, isn't it? Well, from the standpoint of, um, of, it is important, but we here in our facility, in our surgery center, we take things to a much higher level. We're not satisfied with just uh, self-reporting uh, symptoms of patients. It's subjective and so forth, but it is important, okay? Yeah. So uh, we can afford to take things to a higher level, which is why we do pain thresholds, we measure functions on video as we just did because we want to have an objective. We want to know, are we making the patient better or are we making them worse? Right. And the only way to do that is by objective measurements, okay? Okay. All right. Let me stop first. Okay. What is your concern here about oral ketamine? Well, since you, Dr. Kirkpatrick, you've <laughs> all, every time we see you, you say the answer to all the problems, or, or most of the problems with uh, CRPS and RSD, the answer is ketamine. So, since we're having trouble getting <laughs> ketamine infusions for Fern, Fern's uh, doctor has, uh, has uh, prescribed oral ketamine, and Fern actually gets, uh, gets some, some not insignificant self-reporting benefit from that oral ketamine. And when we talked about it with you earlier, and when we talked about it with Dr. Schwartzman, he said, oh no, don't do that, don't do that. And um, then uh, Fern said to Dr. Schwartzman that uh, it helps her, uh, it does make her feel a lot better. And he said, well, then maybe, but um, we thought we'd run that by you. What, uh, give, give me your um, unrestricted and, and uh, don't pull any punches thoughts on oral ketamine. <laughs> He's quite a character, yes. isn't he? Yes. <laughs> and where did I put that script that you wanted me to read? I think I threw it out. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's just start with number one. Uh, patients that have CRPS, they're desperate. They are as desperate as you can be as a human being. Absolutely. And there's a thing that gets inculcated into the mind is called something is better than nothing, okay? And you can't blame them for feeling that way. 
So when it comes to, but what we need to do is we need to talk about ketamine in a, in a scientific, as best we can, scientific manner. Right. First of all, when you take ketamine orally, probably very little of it gets to where it's needed, and that's the brain. Why? Because this thing called first pass effect, meaning in simple English, that it gets taken up by the GI tract and gets chewed up by the liver, okay? Okay. And it forms various metabolites and so forth. Uh, furthermore, there have been instances that, I've, that have, again, reported that patients have developed an allergy to ketamine when taken orally. Okay? How often does that happen? I, I, I don't know. Okay. Don't but know, it can. But it, but it, but it, it can, can happen. It can happen. So now you can't take ketamine or IV, or you, if you do, it's high risk. Okay? Right. Right. Now, ketamine is not only available orally, it, I, it'll soon probably be available nasally here in the United States. Okay? And even there, when you look at the data, uh, you can't really get it high enough, high enough to do any good. And remember, that you're avoiding the liver when you give, take it in your nose, okay? Right, okay. Okay. So there really isn't uh, much benefit. And what Dr. Schwartzman and I are saying is this. In order to be ha be have benefit, ketamine has to affect your brain. It has to shut your brain down temporarily. And if you're going to do that to a patient, you cannot do it while they're at home. You can't do it when they're walking down the street. You have to monitor the patient, okay? So to get the effects that you want, you're going to have to be monitored if you're trying to treat CRPS. So that's putting it to you in, in, in simple English, um, what, the, what the state of the art is in terms of uh, ketamine. So it has to be given IV. Should be done in a facility that can get the dose up high without having to be in an intensive care unit to be at least a three-day infusion. And you want to get the dose up as high as you can and hold it up as long as you can. And that's the four-hour conscious sedation that you talk about. Yeah, conscious sedation, you conscious sedation, you can call it that, but it's a little bit more than that because you're pushing it right up to the point where the patient can hardly remember what's, what what uh, country they live in. Right, okay? right. Okay? All right. So that's a, that's the that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, let's turn over here to uh, Fern. Do you have any, do we have any loose ends we need to tie up today? I don't think so, other than the fact that I think at this point... I'm a little afraid of being worse by dropping all of the meds. Right. Well, that's an understandable feeling, really. It is. Um, so but we're not talking about drop. Coping. We're not talking about dropping all the meds. What we're talking about here is um, getting back to the the idea. We want you to do things that we we feel in in with reasonable confidence are going to make you better, not make you worse. And when it comes to taking oral ketamine, uh, that's 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 what you need to be thinking about at this time. And don't forget, I mean, um, you know, ketamine is very cheap, so we can't make an argument, you know, that it's, uh, it's about money. It's just that it just isn't doing you any good. And you, there's also the risk that you could develop an allergy to it, and that's not going to be a good thing. Okay? Does that have to be um, weaned off? or? I uh, don't think so. There's no evidence that says that you have to be weaned off. You can almost stop it immediately because it, was, it wasn't doing anything at all. Now, remember, there is the thing called placebo. Placebos can be... Uh, good, they can make you feel better in your pain, right? And they can make you feel worse, can't they? Just the thought of going off of something can make you feel nauseated, you know, we know that. So you can feel nauseated as if you're having withdrawal symptoms when really it's just a placebo adverse response. You follow Maybe. me here? Yep. Maybe okay. placebo would help with that. Give her yeah. a placebo to help well, with the withdrawal from the, the placebo. The reason she may have benefited is because when you take a placebo you're probably not going to have any side effects, serious side effects, okay? Yeah. And um, so you take in the, the oral ketamine, and or when you get the ketamine, in your case, you have to be treated uh, at the same time for, the, for induced uh, nausea vomiting, okay? And then the doctors need to know how to do that if you're going to receive ketamine. Okay? Anything else? Uh, okay. We'll think, of it as soon as, we'll, we'll think of it as soon as we leave. Okay. Count on it. Fair enough. Okay, so, I guess I guess we did one more question. One more question. All right. Yes, okay. um, we talked to uh, one of our uh, friends who also has CRPS, and she said that she got some benefit from IVIG therapy. Do you, what can you tell us about that? Is well, that a, is that a viable alternative to uh, or supplement or how, how would that work with uh, the ketamine that we know we need to have I, IV ketamine? Okay, so let's start with. Uh, you know what do we what do we know and what we don't know? The person who's most qualified to answer that question is Dr. Robert Schwarzman, oh, professor and Drexel, chairman right. at Drexel University, right? And as you know, we constantly are having our discussions. Okay, in fact, I even had a discussion today specifically about IV, uh, IG, IG. <laughs> and. Uh, Look, it, it is a protocol that he's, uh, he offers there. It is complicated. He's worked a lot of the kinks out. 
But what you need to understand, there are potential side effects, and one of those side effects is inflammation of the brain, which can be controlled, and he knows how to do it. Okay? It's a temporary okay. thing. Uh, but, you know, talk about inflammation of the brain, that's not something to laugh about. No. Okay? No. Now, the other thing is um, that you need to understand is that it's not a cure. I mean, it's not something that has long-term, you can count on long-term benefit from. But there are some, some benefits to it. Okay? So I would think that if anybody wants to pursue that option, they should really contact him because he's really had an enormous amount of experience with that particular protocol, that treatment protocol. Okay? Any other questions? Okay.